The UK is an island nation. Our lifeline to the world is the sea. Tankers transport fuel, container ships bring us essential supplies, and cruise liners carry holidaymakers near and far. But who are the faces behind these fleets? Meet the Merchant Navy. Commercial fleets include everything from car carriers and tankers to cargo and container ships. Their job? Moving around 90% of world trade by sea. One third of this passes through Singapore in the Far East, a country on one of the busiest shipping routes on the planet. The waters here are deep, so oil supertankers use this as a passage from east to west. Singapore is pretty much at a pinch point of the uh, modern day Silk Road. 50% of all oil that gets moved on ships comes past our doorstep here. Singapore is also home to the biggest container port in the world. Every year, 20 million containers are taken by 200 shipping lines across the globe. This country is becoming a tourist and shopping mecca. It's also a hub for 26,000 international companies, including oil multinationals ExxonMobil, Shell and Chevron Texaco. British company BP has offices here, where oil is bought and sold and vessels are dispatched to move cargoes worldwide. Last year, the company carried over a billion barrels of oil. It's about 50 to 60,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of oil. With so much at stake, ships require regular MOTs on engines and hulls. These take place at Sembawang Shipyard in northern Singapore. Keeping vessels in the best condition is a priority for regional fleet manager Mike Moulding. Uh, she looked pretty good when she's finished. When she's fine, she would uh, look lovely again. The worst thing that could possibly happen is spilling oil. People know about the Exxon Valdez, they know about the Prestige, they know about the Erica, and it's just not acceptable. We work very hard to make sure that all the systems are maintained in the best condition we possibly can. <laughs> Super tanker, the British Progress and her crew are heading into Sembawang for her regular MOT. In just 14 days, she must sail to Iraq to pick up a full load of crude oil, so the pressure is on. If she fails to make this deadline, the costs will be colossal. If the British Progress, for any reason whatsoever, is going to be significantly late, it could range anything from $30,000, $40,000 a day up to $300,000 a day. It is a ship approximately 330 metres in overall length. Two and a bit times around the rails is a mile, and it has a width overall of just under 60 metres. She'll carry around about 2 million barrels, and in today's market of $130 per barrel, we're looking at uh, around $260 million worth of cargo when she's fully loaded. To build one of these new ships now is costing around about 140 million. So you're looking at just over 400 million dollars worth of, of equipment and cargo. The ship is to undergo a wet dock refit, jobs that can be done while the vessel is still in the water. Engineer Superintendent Finlay McRae is the man in charge. If the ship isn't ready to leave for Iraq, it's down to him. There's really a lot to be done, so we have to be very coordinated and stay on top of it. We'll be doing full maintenance in the main engines. We'll be inspecting bearings, overhauling turbochargers, fuel pumps. We have to stick with it, otherwise we will not be able to finish. Finlay works alongside the ship's captain to make sure every job is approached with care. I am responsible for everybody on here and their safety. It is a pressure because I join a ship 
and I look at everybody and I see all their fingers and thumbs and I hope that when they go home, they've still got the same fingers and thumbs in the same place. When in dock, every ship must undertake an evacuation drill in case an emergency breaks out. We have approximately between 200 and 250 people on board, including the ship's crew. So one of our main concerns is that if something goes wrong, can we be sure that we can get them all off safely and accounted for? So to do this, we hold a drill, of the evacuation drill of the whole ship. So everybody has to come off and be accounted for. So we, we hold these drills typically on the, the first day that the ship is in the yard. It's a good feeling when this is done. It's a sense of relief and people can get on with their work. Back on board, the ship's officers check all problems are being addressed. Chief Engineer Kumar Palaver is inspecting the vessel's boilers, something that can't be done at sea. When you're going into the boiler drum, that is a place where you actually uh, check for corrosion or if something is, has come loose or something like that. Checking for faults is a tricky task and a tight squeeze. It's very narrow, you can just barely stand. It's just that how you maneuver inside. It's important because uh, we don't want to have breakdowns because we need to go out of service. So we have uh, the engine opened up. The main engine's seven pistons are being sent to the shipyard's workshops for a sprucing up. It's just like your car. To avoid having a failure, Basically, you take these things out, you pressure test them, you put it all back, and hopefully another 15,000 or 16,000 hours later, we do the same again. If something went wrong at sea, it could be fatal. If the piston failed, basically, it would be very, very dangerous. We'd be putting hot combustion gases into oil, and that doesn't, doesn't go at all, does it? <laughs> For Brian and all the other senior officers, wet dock means the pressure is on. It's quite stressful and it's quite busy. In fact, it's very busy. You see us running about all the time. I do enjoy the job. I still think it's the best job I've ever had. And I've had a few. <laughs> <laughs> when at sea, there are 30 officers and crew on board ship. A tour of duty is upwards of four months, so it's important everyone gets on. We're all here together, we all work together, and there's no reason why we can't play together. And that's what we do. Keeping morale high is a team effort. Living in close confinement can sometimes be tough. We've got some really good guys on board. We've all gelled together and we all get on well. And that makes the family bond better. Even the most junior members of the team have a role to play. Third officer Daniel Tallach is in charge of lifeboat repairs in the shipyard workshops. They're going to be cleaning the whole thing, painting it. Up here, they're going to be changing some of the damaged water pipes. And this will give it a water wall um, around the whole lifeboat so we can get away from the ship safely. This is Daniel's first time in wet dock. The shipyard, it's quite hectic, you know, there's work going on everywhere. There's cranes lifting stuff everywhere. You've really got to be aware of uh, what's going on around you. The punishing deadline is also something new for engineering trainee Colin Brown and fourth engineer Alan Otter. It's a good experience to see these things and seeing all the, the main engine taking the bits has been really good. I've got a chance to see the engine, the full scale, what size it actually is and below the, the case in itself, so just get to see the bigger machinery that you don't get the chance to see it see. I wouldn't say there's too much pressure. There is pressure. I'm gonna have to go and deal with that. It's all hands on deck, above and below, to make sure they're ready for Iraq. Coming up, time off in Singapore for the junior officers and trainees. Nice to get off the ship. And if you do get lonely for ships, you can just kind of 
Have a there's look out there. And there's enough of them out there, right, in there? And D-Day finally arrives. But will the engine start in time? Hopefully, where she goes. If not, it's back to square one again. <laughs> Seafarers of the Merchant Navy ensure world trade is kept on the move 24-7. Ships bring us much-needed supplies like food and fuel from near and far. Be it motor cars, TVs, crude oil, you name it, the chances are it's coming on a ship if it's been made abroad. Singapore in the Far East provides shipyards for commercial shipping. Here, servicing and repairs take place. At Sembawang Oil Supertanker, the British Progress is undergoing a major overhaul. It's an ideal opportunity, an ideal place to take her out of service and to crawl all over that ship and make sure that she's in good condition and do the maintenance that we need to do. It's day five of a punishing 14-day schedule. If the ship's not finished on time, she'll be late to pick up two million barrels of crude oil in Iraq, causing huge financial penalties. If we don't arrive at the load port, we miss the cargo altogether. We could quickly get into the millions. So it's in everybody's interest that the ship gets out on time. Engineer Superintendent Finlay McRae is monitoring 250 shipyard workers toiling flat out to complete the refit. Nobody, but nobody gets hurt. That's our most important. The schedule's tight, but the safety is our uh, top priority. McGee. So why is this man up on top of this? There's no harness, nothing, eh? We must get it done quickly but safely. The ship's officers are on the job too. One of Chief Officer Rob Jackson's main roles at sea is safely filling the ship with crude oil. Time in dock means he can check the oil pipeline for problems. We're looking for damage and also any debris that might be left in there. I'll take the opportunity to go into the chamber and then while I'm in there, I'll crawl up the cargo pipeline. But it's dark, quite claustrophobic and uh, rather smelly. What's happened is the paint has uh, become detached and it's started to uh, corrode away. We'll clean it up and then recoat it. Otherwise, we'll end up with a small pinhole leak in there and once you've got a small leak, it just ends up getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Dripping oil could help create a lethal fire hazard. If anything was overlooked, we'd have to take the ship out of service again. So we like to get these things done now, and then we can get back on and start earning the money again. Although everything must be finished on time for Iraq, juniors Colin Brown, Alan Otter and Daniel Tulloch have snared a day oh, off in Singapore. Yeah. Nice to get off the ship. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic to get off the ship. And if you do get uh, lonely for ships, you can just kind of have a the look out there. And <laughs> <laughs> There's enough of them out there, right, in there? When you are on the ship working, you're working your whole trip through. There's no days off. You don't knock off on a Friday and have the weekend off. It's every day you're working. It is a stressful job. So to get time to go out, relax, see the sights. Going for a walk is a big thing. I mean, like, you can walk out on deck, but it's, you know, there's just water. There's water all around, like, there's no boats, there's no, there's no trees. The best bit about Singapore for myself is just, just getting to see a different, totally different culture. Well, I'm just from a small, small town village, so it's a better experience to go and see other places in the world and say, you are there. There's a lot of different people uh, in Singapore, so you're, you're mingling with a lot of different people. You see this all day? My friends is actually fifteen dollars. You do me a deal, ten dollars. Okay, special price for you. Special <laughs> price for me. <laughs> oh, oh, excellent. This is actually the laughing Buddha, bringing you a good luck and happiness as well. Sweet. And happiness. And happiness. So it's real happiness. Right. Thank you very excellent. Much. Thank you very much. <laughs> What's up, Paul? Massage in the back of your head. Look. Do you want me to do it for you? Come on, Daniel. <laughs>
Since joining the ship seven weeks ago, these three have become friends. When you're on the ship, you're living in each other's pockets. You're socialising together, you're working together, you're eating together, so you get to know each other pretty well, like, and um, you make good friends when you're on board ship. We're all at sea, so we all have to help each other out. Chickens with the heads That's on. Chickens with the heads on. with the heads big. Different from what you get back home, like. Places you see with this job, you would call it glamorous because without doing this, it would cost you a fortune to come and see these places. And a lot of my friends will never see these places that I've been to and seen. And it's a great opportunity to go and travel. You know, we're here to work, but you know, you can still have you a bit of fun. fun as well. you know, so. yeah. Day 12 in the shipyard, and the British progress is being put back together. There are only two days before the ship leaves for Iraq, so it's all go for the captain. I'm walking around at the moment having a look at the jobs that are being completed by the yard so I've got some idea of how much we've got left to do. It's a monitoring from our side to make sure that things are being done and if they're not, it's to highlight it with the yard for them to chase up if need be. Down below, key parts and pipework are being refitted. Well, the engine room's a bit uh, hectic at the moment. It's OK. No worries, leave it. We're now overseeing the fitting of uh, more pipes and valves in our fire system. It's going to be a bit of a busy afternoon. Above deck, they've hit a snag. The weather, well, they say in Singapore there's three kinds of weather. It's either hot or it's raining or it's hot and raining. So right now, I think we're in the raining. The main pressure it's put us under has been uh, painting up the accommodation block, and uh, as soon as they're ready to start painting, it began raining. And it's rained on and off since, but my priority right now is making sure that the job stays on schedule. But it's also the, the most dangerous time, because people get under a lot more pressure in the last couple of days. This is when accidents can happen. We're hard pushed. You try not to let the pressure get to you. If it ever gets to you, then you're in the wrong job and you have to move on somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, we just take it in our stride and get on with it as best we can. With their departure date imminent, the demands on everyone are high. So Captain Johnson and Finlay McRae want all involved to know their work is appreciated. I'd just like to thank you all for coming here this evening and taking part in our dinner, which is a thank you to the shipyard, given the time pressures that we've been under, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. We still have some way to go. There's a lot of scaffolding still around the ship that has to be got rid of, tanks that have to be closed, finishing touches put to the main engine so that we can, can run it tomorrow. If anything, the critical period is just about to start. Day 14, the day of departure, and there's still plenty to be done. At the moment, we're taking back the lifeboats from the workshop and they're all fixed and looking good. The British Progress needs cleared of scaffolding, tools and any shipyard workers left on board. For the officers, there's one final critical job, checking the engines will run successfully. To get the engines started, we apply fuel. The fuel gets injected into the cylinders and hopefully away she goes. If not, it's back to square one again. <laughs> uh, five minutes to so wait while we wait for the gangway to lift. The chief engineer and the captain test the engines. Between bridge and control room, they're in constant radio contact. Hello, Kumar. Yes, Tim. You're ready to go when we give the word. Yeah, I'll just give you a shout before I start, actually. Yep, OK. In the engine room, fourth engineer Alan Otter searches for problems. As the engines are running, you're walking around the engine, making sure there's no leaks making sure that all the systems are working properly. And at the moment, we've still got some minor leaks on the fuel system in the main engine. We want to make sure that everything's running okay, so 
it's quite an important, uh, important part of the day. Back in the control room, Kumar updates the captain. We had a small leak, so uh, just uh, tightening it up, and once it's ready, then we'll go for it. Okay, Kumar, thanks very much. Tugboats hold the ship in position so she stays put while the propeller spins. While down below, the leak is fixed. Okay, yep, we're all ready. The captain can now start the engines from the bridge. Do you want me to run it for any length of time or a start is good enough? It's okay, uh, we are happy here, uh, everything is done. Okay. Okay. Looking good. Start some downstairs, start some up here, and we'll be on our jolly way. As the British Progress finally leaves her berth, it's celebration time for the man in charge of the entire refit. This moment's always a sense of relief when you get actually <laughs> the engine starts and you get going. It's great. You probably see behind me the shipyard will be passing slowly past me. So it's a good feeling. That's the one I've been waiting for. Next time on the Merchant Navy, leaving the busiest port in the world for the Middle East. War zones, never been to Iraq before, some of that is. I'm feeling slightly nervous. And high alert on the high seas as the crew prepares for possible pirate attacks. They're quite professional, some of these lads. Armed guys jumping on ships and waving AK-47s at ships' crews.